Father, I thank you for your holy and your righteous and your blessed word. I thank you for all that you have done for us. I thank you for your magnificence, your kindness, and your goodness to the sons of men. Help us, I pray tonight, as we go through this word, that we can help people understand what the Bible, your revealed word, is all about. Not just so that we will intellectually know it, but that it will mean something in the hearts, in the lives of men. So many, Lord, don't know your word, have no clue as to what it's talking about. So I ask you tonight to help me to do this thing that has been on my heart for a long time. Amen. Amen and amen. Tonight we're going to do something a little different than how I usually teach. I, I was going to do the 100th Psalm and go through those verses and look at those imperatives in it. But due to the fact in America we serve New Year at a certain time differently than what it would have been done in the Hebrew Scriptures, I want to lay out a case to you tonight that I'm going to teach you a way to understand the Bible. A way to understand the Bible in such a way that not only does it make sense to you, like it makes sense to God, but so that you can grasp it, hold it, and begin to understand what's being said and why it's being said. I want to move you away from when people do this. They take their thumbs and rub back and forth and open it, and wherever their thumb sits, they say, this is God's talking to me, God's word. I want to help you to understand tonight the Bible, what the Bible is all about. Well, first thing I want you to understand is the Bible is God's revelation of himself. It's God's revelation of man. It's God's revelation of justice and what righteousness is. So let's go straight into the Bible. The first five books of the Bible would be called Torah. Torah is instruction. And in it, what we will see is God telling how he created the world. He tells it in a limited sense of how he created it, when he created it, and what he created it for. You will find in the first few chapters of Genesis that it shows he created and made everything ready for his man that he was going to bring on the earth. Everything was done first, and then he brought the man and gave him dominion over. We see that God gave him a partner to help to have dominion over it. We'll see as you move through in the Torah, you will see that mankind turned away from God. But the beautiful thing that you'll see in that is that he gives you a backing of what he said before. So when you look in Genesis, you start seeing invisible entities. You see God, you see the Spirit. And you hear the word speaking and it says, let there be light. There's light. So he automatically lets you know that the worldview or the culture that he is setting forth in the Bible is the culture that's based upon his thoughts, his ways, and his justice. So in Genesis chapter 6, you'll find that he says that the sons of God marry the daughters of men. Now, if you have as many commentaries and books as I do, you have a lot of people say one thing about it and some, some say the other. But what you'll need to understand, there is something that has gone awry with the sons of God. You will find as you read through the scripture, God has a lot of sons. He has human sons. He has celestial sons. Some of them are called cherubim. Some are called seraphim. Some are called watchers. And you will find out throughout the Bible there are interactions with them. You'll see in the Torah it shows that God had a design for this world. And in that first book, Genesis, man moved away from that design. He married, well, the sons of God. Some of the sons of God married the daughters of men, and there was wickedness in the earth. And because God had already made a man, gave him the earth to have dominion over, the Bible would teach you that God was always ruling. 
He was always king. And since he was always king, man was supposed to rule things his way. So when man got expelled, some of his other sons came to guard. Those sons are what we call cherubim. They're not little fat babies walking around naked. They are fearsome, ferocious beings, sons of God that will defend his honor at all costs. So he destroyed the world because of wickedness. And we begin to see how the Bible works. If the Bible said that God destroyed the earth and the earth was still standing, you should not impose upon it your thoughts, your definition of him destroying the earth. His destroying is he cleaned it off, got rid of a lot of the wicked people and gave man another chance. In giving man another chance, he set up a rule for mankind to have. So as you see that, you move on through the scripture and you see the table of nations. You see that after what was called the flood, there's a division of how the nations were split up after the flood. In Genesis chapter 11, you'll see something that's even more magnificent. You'll see how they spread throughout the earth. You then see a man named Abram. And from there, we're going to move in macro. When I say macro, big gulps of the Bible at one time. But to get that first foundation, the first 12 chapters of Genesis is very important. Again, you'll see that there's a spiritual world, the world of the unseen that's real. You see that there's the human world and the things that we touch, the things that are seen. And it's not just the spiritual world is the things of the unseen. We have things like wind, thoughts, words that are not seen, but are real, but it's intertwined with the physical. So what God did was he allowed all of the sons of God that were going to rule over nations. There were 70. They were able to rule over the nations of men. You won't get that till you get to the fifth book in the Torah, the fifth book of Moses. But if you want to write it down just so you'll have it, it's Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8. You can read it in your King James Version, but I also would like you to look it up in ESV or English Standard Version because it's going to give you what the Dead Sea Scrolls would say. And what that is, is when the Most High, because you have to understand there are other beings, there are other deities. When I say deities, celestial beings with powers, okay? If you think that what I'm saying is wrong, especially if you have any kind of biblical background, you know Paul talked about principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. You know the Bible talks about the devil and the Bible talk about evil spirits, demons, etc. So when the Most High, who's over all of the demons that are called gods in English, but the Hebrew word is Elohim, when he separated the nations, he did it according to the sons of God, those beings. If you use a Septuagint version, by chance you use them more when you're looking up stuff, it'll say the angels of God. Your King James is going to say to the sons of Israel. So I need you to understand that this is what's going on. So when he did that in chapter 11, we see that God had no nation that was following him. He chooses one man, Abram. Your whole, your whole first five books of the scriptures is going to be dealing with Abram and his family and his God. It's not dealing with all of the other nations primarily. It's showing you how God has worked and set up his plan for the children of Abram. Now, we could have talked about that that goes before that, but if I do that, we won't have to do Genesis. So Abram ends up having sons he has his sons, his sons have sons, and they have the same promise that Yahweh gave Abraham. The problem, promise that God gave Abraham, his name was changed to Abraham, that through his seed, his descendants, all of the nations of the earth that had other gods would be blessed. Not only would they be blessed, but that his seed would possess the gates of his enemies. 
And so the whole battle that you are seeing, there's a battle going on in the Bible that these sons of God, these ones that have turned away from Yahweh, they are wanting to destroy the children of Abraham, those that are children of Abraham that follow Yahweh so that they don't go to the eternal damnation. In order to explain that, and I'm not going to go through it, but if you want to write down 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12, the real key is if they can hold off people of God doing what God had told Abram that his seed would possess the gates of his enemies. All of the enemies of Abraham's family are those 70 nations. And they would have to be able to go in, follow Yahweh's rule, and teach the other nations how to live. So we see Abram living, walking with God, and God has told him, your children will be like the stars of heaven and like the, sea, the, the sand by the seashore. They would be a heavenly group as well as an earthly. Then we see that God works through Abraham and sends his children off his descendants in the slavery. When you see them being sent off in the slavery, begin to understand this. This is something that will not look fair. It is something that looks like it's really just a big story. But what it is, is him showing that I take and I keep my word, but I don't do everything. Rush, rush fast. I work with people, I work with nations. While I'm working with building up my nation, when I'm having them in a slave camp, they weren't the slave the whole time. But while they were set aside and being slaves, they weren't mixing. They were pure. And as far as I can see in the scripture, they were pure. But there were other nations that God had to execute his judgment on because he is the judge of all the earth, and since Abraham is supposed to possess the nations, they would have to execute God's judgment and rule. Well, that's, if you want to talk about a magnus opus, him bringing those people out of Egypt, that's what he's talking about, he's going to do. That is the magnus opus that's going to be over and over and over reiterated in the scripture. So he does that. The people come, the people get ready to come out in the book of Exodus. You say, Tim, you didn't tell us about Joseph. No, I didn't tell you everything because if I did, I'd be finishing Genesis. But in the book of Exodus, which is the second book of Moses, you see that all of the records that you had seen in Genesis where they said, this is the record of, this is the record of, this is, those are written records compiled by Moses. Then the Exodus starts to talk about God bringing them out. The children of Israel, who were the children of Jacob, who were the children of Abraham, Isaac, and were the children of Abraham, those that were against the nation, Satan, the Satan and his horde of the disobedient sons of God did not want them to execute God's judgment. And so they were in Egypt, they were captive, they were made slaves, they were mistreated, they cried to God, God sent a deliverer. And the deliverer that God sent was a man. And the man that he sent listened to Yah. When he listened to Yah, Yah gave him his thoughts, his words, and how he wanted to make a culture for them. Not the culture of the Canaanites, not the culture of the other people, not the, uh, the culture of the Africans or the Europeans or the culture of the people that are in Asia or China. He was going to give them a culture because what you do and your laws and your judgment system of justice makes your culture. He was making a culture for them so that they would be the family or the nation of Yah. If you get that in your mind, you have gone through Genesis, you're almost through Exodus, you see that now he's going to bring them out of the book of, I mean, out of Exodus, out of Egypt, and when he brings them out of Egypt, he starts to show them how sacrificial system works, he starts putting training wheels on them. Mentally see training wheels. I'm going to train you how to think. I'm going to train you who I am. And when you learn who I am, I'm going to show you pictures that in the future, your descendants will know me and how I operate by looking at what I'm doing with you. I'm making a resume. And my resume will be 
for your descendants. But you are going to walk through it and learn me and see my powers. Everything that looks like it's bad, everything that comes up, every wicked sign that you see from those sons of God, you're going to see I'm the most powerful of all. You're going to see him fight against gods. Then you're going to see them make a declaration that they will be his people and that they will follow him no matter what. And when they make that declaration, that seals a covenant that he made with them and them alone, no other nation in the world. But then you'll find out he teaches them how to deal with sex, how to deal with menstrual periods, how to deal with theft, how to deal with adultery, how to deal with liars, how to deal with court, how to deal with slander, how to deal with raising your children, how to deal with even doing your crops, how to rest, how to treat your indentured servant. He's going to build them a culture. They agree to it. They say all that you have said, we're going to do it. and We're going to be obedient. Then he decides to let them know I'm going to dwell with you. They build an edifice is reminiscent to where God had first made man, which was the Garden of Eden. He builds a type and a figure of that. And so you find the rest of Exodus telling you how to go through the ceremonial worship. Then you move from Exodus to the book of Leviticus, and now he starts to show that you are to be a blessing to all the nations. But in order for you to be a blessing to all the nations, you got to know what I want. If you don't know, ah, that was good. If you don't know what I want, you're going to think and make me what you want me to be. So I'm going to teach you about how to be sanctified, which is another word for holy. I'm going to teach you how to be separate from the other nation. I'm going to teach you how to be separate from your own thoughts. I'm going to tell you what I want. I'm going to tell you how to purge yourselves or to have your sins. Let's say it that way. Sins covered. They're not going to be totally gone away from you, but I'm going to show you how to have them covered. I'm going to show you which ones are not covered. I'm going to show you some have to be, you have to be put to death for, but I'm going to show you that I'm a loving and forgiving God, but I'm going to show you that there's a manner. I'm going to show you how you are to worship. I'm going to show you what it means to be anointed and set apart for me. I'm going to show you in this book how not to go against my judgment. There's a real beautiful picture in there where two men, they go against God's mode of worship and they introduce something new. And God actually kills them, burns them up in their clothes. And you find that when that happened, Moses tells the man, the, the man that died father, you better not show any upset. You better not tear your clothes. You better not act like you don't like it. Because he's going to show himself as holy. He's going to show the diet that they would have, which are part of the training wheels. I don't want you taking on the other nation's cultures. I don't want you learning the magic from the other nations. I don't want you talking to the dead like the other nations do. I don't want you following witchcraft like the other nations. I don't want you learning from these spirit beings that teach things that will take you away from the culture that I have given you. Then he's going to show them there are special days that are set aside for me and me alone because I got something for you to learn. Seven days that set up, well, seven what we call feasts, more than, more than special times that's for me. And what they're going to do is be training wheels to prepare you for the final, most important son of Abraham, who is Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus the Christ. It's going to show you these things. Then he's going to show them, listen, the land is mine. I'm going to show you how freedom works. He gives them something called the Ubel. We call it Jubilee. Then there's an amazing chapter where he shows if you ever turn your back on me as a nation, I'm going to treat you with judgment like the other nation that I've set you up to judge. I'm going to judge you and if you ever go and be a partaker of their gods and learn their ways 
and move away from my culture and bring their culture into this culture that I'm making, I'm going to kick you out of the land. I'm going to pluck you out of the land. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. I'm going to get rid of you out of this nation. And I'm going to beat you down. And so many times you're going to be hungry. You're going to be starving. You're going to have your children eat, being eaten by the parents. You're going to be dung on the ground for, from, the, from the beast of the field and the fowls of the air. But finally, after this, you go through this so long, your descendants will hear me and they'll be able to come back to the land. Then he has the book of Numbers, where they number the children, the ones that are the descendants, in the thousands and thousands and thousands. And he teaches them what it means to be blessed. He has Aaron to give them a blessing. He sets up how many. He shows that they are heads of tribes, and they're going to be all men, whether you like it or not. Then it's going to show how it integrates with what you've already read in uh, Leviticus and show you that there were times they tested and they went against what y'all wanted. Different ones would want to rise up and go against Moses. They would have battles and fights where they would have to go in and conquer land and they would be afraid because there were still giants again in the land. There have been giants I told you about in the first book. Now there are giants again because when those beings, the sons of God, married the daughters of men, guess what? The bodies died, but the spirits were still around. That's where you get demons from. And so there'll be giants, but he's going to tell them, Abraham, he defeated five sets of giants. The Moabites, you're going to learn about them. They defeated giants. The Edomites, they defeated giants. The Ammonites, they defeated giants. This is good stuff. And so he's going to say, why is it you can't trust me? And as you read that, hopefully your mind will understand that when they come in in our world and they're going to force all kind of um, homosexual, going to force all kind of worship against God, force evolution on us, and you see that this nation, and you see that these systems of judgment are so big, like giants, and you think we can't win, then you remember what happened with them. Then you will see them testing God. You can't give us certain things to eat. You will see God's judgment about complaining about what he's doing. You will see there are times when individuals, they would mix with other nations and bring damnation on themselves because every time they mix, they then they would get into sex. You mix, you get into sex because sex is one of the strongest forms of religion and worship in the world. We, you'd see that in the book of Romans, but we're not there yet. Then we go to the book of Deuteronomy. When we get to the book of Deuteronomy, we see that those people that did not do what God said, they determined it was too big to be fault. And guess what happened? God said, because you wouldn't listen, I got a track record. And you didn't look at my track record? You don't believe me? So the demons, the gods or the Elohim of the world were able to hold back God's judgment that were going to come on nations because those people would not do what he said. And because they wouldn't do for 40 years, those other nations got to still be as wicked as they were without getting God's laws coming to him and that culture coming into their culture because they disobeyed. So he's going to give them a rehearsal. This will be Moses giving, in so many words, a rehearsal of what has already taken place how God had worked for you all, and he's given the last word of a man that's going to die. It's not like he's going to die right away, but there's a time period he's going to die, and they're going to have to take the promised land. He gives them a series of instructions on how to raise their children, how to raise their sons, and to stay away from false religion, not to get involved with it, not to intermingle with it, and then he gives them a list of blessings and curses that will be upon them. You ought to read that as you go through in Deuteronomy 28, 29, and 30. Then you'll see around the end of this time, it comes time for Moses at 120 years old to die. And at that time, it's time for Moses to die. And since it's time for him to go, he's going to replace him with the leader. That leader will be 
Joshua, his servant. Well, Timmy hadn't said much about Joshua. This is an overview. That's the Torah. Now, the beautiful thing about the Torah is this. All of the rest of the scriptures in your Bible is going to go back and refer to that. Not every single one, but what you're talking about. The book of Joshua will refer back to Torah because what Joshua is going to do is the things that Moses taught because he got it from God, because God was giving him a culture, God was giving him character, God was giving him a way to live. Joshua is going to keep with that. If you look in that first chapter of Joshua, he's going to say this book of the Torah or the law, it shall not depart out of your mouth. And so they go into the promised land and God started judging the nations that had been enslaving people wickedly, killing people, raping people, going and serving other gods, making all kind of havoc on the earth. You're talking about the problem of evil. And now God was using his people to execute judgment. Because remember, if you remember your Bible, God gave the world to man to rule. Not that he's over it, but that God rules, man rules under God, make it on earth as it is in heaven. I can come down and slap down the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, etc. But I want you to do it. And so they start going in and they start executing the judgment of God on the nation and God dispossesses those people and give them the land. Then you start seeing what it is like when somebody is in God's camp, in that culture that turn away and don't want to do it. God say how he brings judgment on the whole nation. You are supposed to be one culture, not one culture on this Sunday, one culture on that Sunday, one culture on this Sabbath, and another. You're supposed to all be following me. You will see that. And then you will see how God blessed two men. To old men with long life so that they can see God's blessing come. And as God's righteousness was spreading through the nation, you'll see what happens when people don't follow God all the way. You'll see that they'll leave part of the nation that's supposed to be judged. You'll see what happens when you listen to the wrong people and you make leagues or that you make covenants with other nations. And when he said, don't do it. All you need is me. You don't need that covenant. That's in the book of Joshua. Then you see Joshua gets ready to die. Once Joshua gets ready to die, he lets the people know, look, you can't serve God. He's holy. You all still have other gods that you have brought in. You can't do you you can't serve him like that. He doesn't allow it. It's not based on you, it's based on him. He's holy. Joshua dies, and you end the book of Joshua, and now you move to the book of Judges. But the book of Judges, again, everything goes back to Torah. You want to know how to live? You want to know what they were doing, right or wrong? You look at what was in Torah. You want to understand the Bible? Don't bust it open in the middle and start reading, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I be afraid? That's not how it works. So in the book of Judges, seven times those people turn away from God and seven times God judges them by sending a deliverer. But you know what caused them the seven times to turn their back on God and lose about 350 years of taking over? I believe it's the second chapter of Judges that tells you after Joshua died, another generation rose up that did not know Yahweh didn't know what God had taught through Moses and Joshua, the parents who didn't teach. So this is where you get your pictures of Samson, Deborah, Barak, Jephthah, Gideon, all of these people who God would send them, some of the most unlikely people, to deliver the people. But one of the things about the book of Judges that really stick out is it kept saying, and they didn't have a smith in the land. They couldn't. They didn't have an iron smith, and they didn't have a king. So after you go through the book of Judges, then you see they are headed downhill. Then another book jumps up on the scene. You have the book of Ruth. It's not written by Ruth, but this book 
is during the time of the judges. And you find that there, there, there's, a, there's one family in there that really sticks out, but that's not the major family. But there's one family that sticks out in a man and his sons and, and their wives. You have a man, I'll give you the name, I really didn't want to, but it's Malon, Chilion, and Halimelech, and Naomi. These are children of Israel that have gone against what I told you in Leviticus. When the nation turns against God, and I've already told you in the book of Judges, they did it. I've already told you in the book of Joshua, they didn't capture all the land. This is a continuing story. This is a continuing flight. These are real people. And so when the judgment came on the land, and guess what the name of the place was? Bethlehem or bet Lechem, the house of bread. They are starving in the house of bread, but it's only because they've gone against Yah. They could never starve. If you start reading and you'll see what he promises them in Leviticus 26, you will know that God's judgment was on them. And they go in, you know, to Moab and the men die. And the wives are left. One wife stays there and the uh, mother wife, she's come back. Well, really, she's a widow now. And this one comes back with her name, Ruth. Ruth sees something in this woman, Naomi. And when you read it, you're going to wonder what it is that she sees. She sees behind the circumstance. She sees that what has been promised to them, looking back over history, I want a part of that. And so as she became a servant, trying to help take care of this widow, she meets this man that goes out every day and says, Shalom, Shalom, Shalom. His name is Boaz. And you'll begin to understand something about why it is elder brothers mean something so much in the Bible. And what he did was he took what is called a Leverite marriage to raise up children to a dead ancestor. So he marries this woman. But the beautiful thing about that marriage was not just the marriage, because there was one man that rejected it. It's the fact that when she got pregnant and had a baby, they named the baby. Obed, Boaz, and, and actually she's in Matthew in the genealogy of the Christ. Obed had a son named Jesse. Jesse had a son named David. And with that, I'm going to take you from the book of Ruth to 1st and 2nd Samuel. 1st and 2nd Samuel, some Bibles would call it 1st and 2nd Kings. And, but just know this, I'm going to give you six books right now. They cover the kings. First and second Samuel, because you're dealing with Saul and you're dealing with David. First and second Kings, um, first and second Chronicles. Chronicles, some people say, is the record of what the kings would have written. If that's not technically what it is, suffice it to say, you're going to see a lot of repeating and some filling in the gaps in Chronicles and what was in the kings. So again, everything goes back to Moses. Why does everything go back to Moses? Because when Moses was alive, he said the time will come in Deuteronomy 17, you will have a king and he needs to write a copy of this law, all these five books, all these rules, because he's got to judge my people. Read Deuteronomy 17 and learn that. So the people start crying for a king. What is, it, what is the reason they cry for a king? Well, first, you got some ungodly anointed people. You got high priests and his sons. You got the sons laying up, sexing the women, beating them out of tithes, taking God's stuff, appropriating it for themselves, sexing the women inside of the temple, and his fat tail is sitting there allowing it to go on. He's anointed, but he accuses this woman named Hannah wrong, and God allowed this woman to be barren, and you know you women that can't have children, what that feels like, but God did that, and we see that God allows her to have a child, and then she goes and gives the child back to God. And you're going to say, I remember that when I was back reading Exodus, that all firstborn sons belong to God. You had to either give him back to God or pay a half a shekel to the temples. That's what she's doing. She's not going to pay the shekel and give him to God. And the child gets to be a priest. The child grows up. And as he's growing he meets God. Yeah, he's going to see God. That's what they call a Christophany or a Theophany. 
And God tells him, this Eli dude, he didn't say, dude, this Eli priest, he ain't all of that. He letting stuff go on. He honors his son above me. My culture does not get changed for pity. My culture does not get changed because you're an anointed. And so therefore, you are young and it don't even look like you should be able to say, but when I give you the word, your word is going to be the kind of word the Bible said. He said, not one of his words dropped to the ground. Imagine me holding this and I let it go and it won't drop. Good God Almighty. So God judged them. Then the people got to the place well, it said his sons, when he got older, Samuel's sons wasn't doing right. And they said, we're going to have a king. We are going to have a king. No, no matter what you say, we're going to have a king. And, and he's like, all right. They get upset, want to have a king. And God said, I'm going to give you one. I'm going to give you what you want. You say you want a king that can go in and out before you in war. We want someone that look good for us. I'm going to give you what you want. So he found a good-looking man and anointed him. You read the story. You'll be around 1 Samuel chapter 8, 9, and 10. You'll get the good juice of that. But that man at one time was humble. That's what some of the black people say, humble instead of humble. And then he changed from being humble, and he became arrogant, and he loved the power, and then he was impatient. And then there was one day he was supposed to be waiting on Samuel, because you begin to see when God makes a king, understand, please, when you read your Bible, learn that God had been their first king. He had worked through Moses. We talked about that in, in the first part of the Torah. He worked through Joshua in the book of Joshua. He worked through Judges in the book of Judges. We don't see a whole lot in the book of Ruth. But in 1 Samuel, we see a high priest. And now we see Samuel. So the prophet anoints the king. The prophet is anointed by God. He is called a son of God. The prophet anoints the king. He is called a son of God. The king executes God's judgment. Don't, don't forget that. When you read the king, the king executes God's judgment. If somebody steals, you gonna the king makes them pay. If somebody kills, he makes sure he's put to death. If there's a land dispute, the king deals with it. But he's got to do it according to God's word, his standard, his culture. The prophet, his job is to be what you call a prosecuting attorney when they do wrong. Saw you doing wrong. <laughs> And Saul was supposed to say, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. But Saul is like, well, the people made me, and I did. And so the prophet, the kings often wouldn't listen to the prophets. But the prophet was just as much of a man of God as he was. And since I've already mentioned high priest, the high priest was supposed to be just as anointed. He was supposed to be anointed by God to do the service inside of the tabernacle. I wish to God I hadn't left it out, but I'm going to go back and get it because I can. When I was talking about the sacrificial system, one of the sweetest days was the 16th chapter is when God let them have the day of atonement. That's the most major of all of the sacrifices to cover sin. The high priest is the only one that could approach God like that. So you have a prophet that's anointed by God. You have a high priest that's anointed by God and the king. They're all separate. And you will find that the kings often would have prophets killed. So now you understand when Saul went against the prophet. He calls himself going to make a sacrifice like the priest, and that wasn't his job. And God rejected him because he would not execute his judgment on the nation, the Amalekites. He found another way to do it. I can get some benefit out of this, and I don't have to execute complete judgment. God never has to tell him I want, why I want complete judgment on the nation. I know more about that nation than you'd ever know. God replaces him with a man, a lad named David. David is anointed to become king. And as you read in 1 Samuel, you will find Saul is anointed as king and David is anointed as king at the same time. This man Saul is king, but now he's king in name. He's got the position. This one is anointed. He's king in name, but he doesn't have a position yet. And his job is to serve this one. And he serves this one, but this one is angry and he's jealous and he wants to kill him. 
But God continually lifts this man up, gives him victory, and this man gets some of the credit, but the people know that it's David. And eventually, God lets this man come to the place where he's going to die. And one of the interesting things you'll see in 1 Samuel 28, he goes to a witch, a divination, a diviner, the very thing God told him not to do. And raises this man that was a priest from the dead. Samuel was a priest and a prophet, but mostly he's known as a prophet and raises him from the dead. Well, Saul ends up dying the next day and it's over for Saul. So now you've covered what's in 1 Samuel. You go to 2 Samuel, you see the life of David as he becomes king. You see the life of David as he goes and has victories, as he has wars, as he stands up and he wants to build, he builds himself a house. You see David go in and try to right some of the wrong that was done during the time of Eli and his son. You find out, oh, oh yeah, that was the Ark of the Covenant that God used when we read back in Exodus. I tell you everything, go back to the first five books. He wants to bring that back. And God shows you through David that worship has to be done his way because there was a certain way that Ark was supposed to be covered. I mean, not covered, but carried, covered too, but they ended up putting it on a cart. And it started shaking. And somebody touched it and God killed him. And David got angry. We'll see that David, after God had given him such victories, gave him power, he started marrying more women than he should. Because God had made it one and one. The man started doing other inventions. And David sees a man's wife, a Hittite, a black man's wife, took her. And he brought damnation on his home because he took the man's wife, broke that covenant that they had made with God back in Exodus. All that the Lord has said, well, we do. Broke that thing that God has said, write my laws down and keep them. That's what he told him to do in the first five books. So now David becomes an adulterer, worthy of death. David becomes a murderer, worthy of death. And so now God brings judgments on his house. His wives get raped. His daughter end up getting raped. Four of his sons get raped. One son gets to get ready to make a coup on him. And then you end up seeing that he lost a lot of his kingdom. These are some of the things you see. And so when you read the psalm, when you see stuff like him saying, have mercy on me, O oh Lord. Or oh, you hear him saying, forgive my iniquity and my trespasses against me. When you hear him in the psalm say, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stand in the way of sinners. You are hearing David. You don't pick up the psalm and this says this to me. It was happening in the lives of people. Look and see what was happening. Understand what was happening and understand your Bible so that you don't make it be to you. It's about God. It's about God, how he worked with people, how the people that listened to God, he gave them victory, how the people that didn't, he, <coughs> and how those people had to come back to him to get it right. And David gets to the place where he gets older. And then he has a son that takes the throne named Solomon. Solomon takes the throne. And you're going to have this in 1 Kings where he takes the throne. You have some of that in, and then we start going into the Chronicles. And when he was made king, his brother wanted to take the place. So he had to put him to death because he's trying to make a coup. But then you begin to understand if his brother try to take his place, the king is anointed by God. You can't kill the anointed person of God. You talk about him. You can correct him. But you better not be the one to kill him. So Solomon asked God for wisdom to judge his people. That's the job of the king to execute God's judgment. He said, I don't know how to do it. So God gives him and grants him wisdom. Above all, and then Solomon does righteous judgment, and the people fear the king and God because he knew God was with him to do judgment. Solomon get tested by the queen of Sheba. People would come around from all over to hear the rhythm of Solomon, and they got, Solomon builds God a house. After he builds God a house, he begs God that if your people 
ever turn away from you. Your people that you set up by covenant, your people that you sent their ancestor Abram to be their father, your people that you that made covenant with you in the mountain of Sinai, your people that you have gone through all those years through the judges in the book of Joshua, etc. Those people, if they turn away and you do what you said you were going to do in Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, 29, if they will remember, if they remember who they are, if they remember what they're supposed to be and turn toward Jerusalem, your holy place, that you would hear and you would forgive them. And so God appeared to Solomon, told him he would do it. But he said, don't you ever turn away from me, Solomon. If you forsake me, Solomon, I will forsake you. I don't care what nobody else say. When you read your Bible, you will see he tells Solomon that. Well, guess what Uncle Solomon does? He builds God a house. He builds him a big, sweet temple. And he builds a temple that is immaculate. But he goes against the things that were told him not to do when they were supposed to make a copy of the law in Deuteronomy 17. He multiplies wives. He multiplies horses. He multiplies gold. He multiplies silver. He multiplies servants, manservants, maidservants, taxes the people. He does all of that grandeur stuff and starts building houses for these wives that served other gods. And they turned his heart away from God. Why do you think that when you read the book of Deuteronomy, it say, don't give your sons to their daughters. Don't give your daughters to their sons. They will turn their heart from me. They'll forget their own culture. They'll become amalgamated into their culture and forget me. Solomon did that. And God took the kingdom from him and gave it to another man, just like he took it from Saul and gave it to David while he was living. He took part of Solomon's kingdom and gave part of it to a man named Jeroboam. And as you read the kings, you're going to see the different kings would rise up and they would serve other gods. You'll have a few that will do righteous. You'll have Asa do righteous for a little while. Jehoshaphat will do righteously for a little while. Hezekiah will do righteously for a little while. Josiah will be the last one that does righteously. And then his son Zedekiah goes into Babylon, get his eyes poked out. That's where you're going to really end up in the Kings. That's where you're going to really end up in Second Chronicles. But the nation is going to split under Solomon's son named Rehoboam. And when it splits under Rehoboam, that same man Jeroboam, who God gave part of the kingdom to while Solomon was alive. And, and, and I think I'm saying it wrong. He did it verbally. But in actuality, it happened when his son Rehoboam came on the throne. Rehoboam was haughty. Rehoboam did not want to follow God. And so then Jeroboam, when he got to be the king, the nation split. So you have Judah down here. That's the nation. It's called Judah. And Benjamin, two of the tribes will be together, Judah and Benjamin and a little of the Levites. The other 10, Ephraim, Gad, Manasseh, etc., they were in the north. So you'll start seeing the Bible talk about Ephraim. You'll see the Bible talk about Israel. Then you see him talk about Judah. Those are two nations. The kingdom split. The kingdom had been won under David. The kingdom had been won under Solomon. All of them were combined. Now the kingdom is split. So when you read your Bible, you're reading about Israel and Judah. It's the same people, but it's split. Now that it is split, you have Jeroboam. I don't want you all to ever go back to Judah and serve God. He changes the days of the holy days. I didn't say holidays. Holiday, look it up in the etymology just online. Holiday is another word for holy day. That somebody has said they had real holy days. And he changed the days to another month so that they wouldn't go and serve Yahweh. Then he set up bulls and said, these be your gods. The same kind of bulls that you would have read about if you read Exodus, like I'm telling you, when he set up a god and said, these be gods that brought you up out of Egypt and the people, a lot of the people got killed for that. After he got on the throne, did that kind of dirt, you'll notice that the Bible keep talking about Israel. They never had a righteous king. 
And they keep saying they follow the sins of Jeroboam. Jeroboam who made Israel the sin. Jeroboam. Then you'll go through different kings. You'll go through Zimri. You'll go through, uh, what's that dude named Omri. Omri is not mentioned that much in the Bible. But I can tell you this much about Omri. Omri is just like Nimrod in the book of Genesis that you're going to read about when they do the Tower of Babel. There was a lot of secular history about him. Well, Omri, he did wickedly. But his son... The Bible said his son was worse than all of them, worse than Jeroboam. His name was Ahab. And Ahab married the daughter of Jezebel, and they brought in that by all worship. And they would make high places, and they would make trees that they would worship. When you read your Bible and you see the groves, that is trees. When you see them talking about statues, often it would be the trees. When you see Asherah pole, when you look it up, those are the trees that they would bring because in the forest, they would feel that certain deities would be there and they would always remember demons would teach. So they went on from Ahab to the different kings. Ahab ended up getting killed. The dog licked his blood. His wife Jezebel get killed. The dog eat her flesh. And lick up her blood, and it's quite beautiful the way that it happens. But during that time, when you get through the kings, you're going to realize something. I finished the kings, I finished chronicles. Now I got these books that come after that. These are what they call the wisdom books or the writings. You'll have books like um, Job, Psalm, Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes. And in those books, not only are you going to find wisdom, you're going to find a way to worship. And it's not going to give you a whole lot about the lives of those people. Job will give you a lot about his life. But Job is considered to be written before Genesis. And you will see how in the book of Job, how God allows you to see behind the curtain. It's just like when you have a phone. Behind the phone, you got a lot of programs working behind the phone that you don't realize just like I was talking to my brother today, I say what the demons do is that even if they don't inhabit you, they work just like people's video games. I used to watch my sons play Madden or something like that. And those games are predestined. And when I say they're predestined, that means that a man that's playing football on Madden doesn't get to shoot a basketball. He doesn't get to play hockey. But they can choose which one they want to run. They can choose what kind of characteristics they want to give, whether they want them to make a pass, whatever. So there is free will inside of that realm. There's free will for us inside of the realm of this world. I cannot fly like a bird. Okay? But there can be machines made that can fly that I can sit in. So what ends up happening is, you see, inside of that world of what I'm talking about, the, the video game in our world, there are still those demons. There are still those spirits that don't want to be judged. And so what they do to get you to do things to hold you back or hold us back from the time God's going to continually deal with them, what they do is they can get on your TV. And they can tell you everybody's doing this. Or they can put this show on TV where everybody's dancing and twerking and doing stuff like that. Or everybody's man kissing man, woman kissing woman, people killing. Or the greatest lawyer on this one show, she's a whore. Talking about scandal. Or you got some movie that black people get all excited about called The Black Panther. And they parade before you raising the dead. Where they show you that a man that stood for what is really just, he is made the villain, whereas the other one is not. And then they show you a kingdom where women are ruling, which is not what you will see nowhere in the Bible. And so what ends up happening is you see that what they will do is put images. Then they'll have songs that will tell you what to do and how to live. Then they'll give you different holidays and feasts. Then they'll take over your laws. They will program people by the thoughts, by greed, so that they will cause the people that are descendants of Abraham to say, we can't overcome. That's what they do. And he was trying to keep them from those things all of the time by giving them their own culture. So Jezebel dies, and after that, the other kings rise. They go against the prophets. Here is the thing. 
you'll begin to see that during the time of the kings, every one of the prophets, they call the major prophets, you know, you, you'll start with Jeremiah and you will go through, you'll deal with Ezekiel and Isaiah and different ones that they call the major prophets, 12 of them. Then you have those that are called minor prophets. Listen, none of those people will walk around being called a minor prophet. But all of those prophets will come and tell the king that your nation is doing wrong. And what they would be quoting would be what Moses said. It would never be anything new. When you listen to Jeremiah or read Jeremiah, he's going to tell them, he's going to give them a history of what God had done. When you listen to Ezekiel, Ezekiel is going to tell them what God had done. When you listen to Daniel, you're going to see a fulfillment of what God told Hezekiah what happened to his children if they got outside of his word. If you listen to Joel, you're going to hear Joel talk about what God's going to do and how he has done what he's done before and the judgment that is going to come on his people. When you listen to Amos, Amos is going to say, you all are all into this worship like he told you in the, in the book of Exodus, as definite like he told you in the book of Leviticus, but you're not keeping his laws. Your worship is nothing to him. Nothing. You made him mad. You're going to look in the book of Jonah, and you're going to see that God is going to send Jonah and let Jonah say, look, I am the God of you people in Nineveh. I dealt with you all before when I destroyed the Tower of Babel. You're going to see that Jonah is not wanting to go and do that because he'd rather deal with Israel because he knows that God can send them into captivity. He knows that God can destroy them and he doesn't want this to happen. When you look in that home, you'll see God talk about the judgment that's on him. His people, not because of somebody else, because of him. Same thing with Habakkuk. Same thing with Nehemiah. Well, Nehemiah is a little different. Nehemiah and Ezra, they're a little different than Haggai. Because you're going to see that these people are taken into captivity. Let me get my serious look on. <clears throat> when they sinned against God, You'll see in the last chapter, 36th chapter of Second Chronicles, around the 15th and 16th verse, because they wouldn't listen to the prophets. All of the prophets that you're going to see that comes after Second Chronicles, the major and the minor, all the way down to Malachi, they are included during the time of the kings. But you don't write them together. Unless you have a Reese chronological Bible. You see them come afterwards, but they'll go back and refer to those kings. That's why I just say in the days of Hezekiah or in the days of Amos or in the days of Amaziah or in the days of Josiah. It's letting you know the time frame. You're going to see that they get taken into captivity. In 722 BC, God takes Israel, the upper northern part, and put them into captivity. And they take them and scatter them throughout the world bringing in other people, the Assyrians. And let me tell you this. At the cost of Baal, Baal, and the grove, the trees, and it's about those golden calves that they had. It's really about them bringing in other type of worship while they were still worshiping Yahweh. Judah down here was still considered righteous in so far as what you call righteous, not because of how they were living. But they were still having more time with Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. They wouldn't listen to Jeremiah. Threw Jeremiah in the pit. Beat Jeremiah. Jeremiah's crying, Lord, I didn't come to these people. Lord, I ain't gonna talk no more. But your word is just like fire. Shut up in my bones. Jeremiah couldn't forbear. And they got sent into captivity under Jeremiah. Ezekiel had already been carried away with them. And so you see in around 597, 96, and 588, there were three deportations that were happening in Judah. So the northern part was carried away, 722. About 100 years later, a little over 100 years later, seemed like that's when the southern part got carried away for the same thing. Worship in the grove, worship in the high places. In Ezekiel chapter 8, women crying for 
Camus, whose birthday is December the 25th. And then you also see that they had all kind of creatures on the wall. So you get to see the prophets. You get to see what Ezra and Nehemiah and Haggai, they get to come back, like Leviticus said, according to the law. And now the, the land is destroyed and they want to build it back. And so Nehemiah is instrumental in rebuilding the wall. And during that time, they want to rebuild the temple. And the people saw the glory was not like it was the first time. From that, we move from the prophets to the intertestamental period. And we don't have a lot of that in our Bible, unless you have a Bible that would carry the Maccabean period. And you'll deal with Alexander. And you'll deal with some of the things that happened during the time of Xerxes. Uh, you'll get a little bit of that in the book of Esther. In the book of Esther, it kind of fits in between right after they get into Babylon. But then you come to what is called the New Testament. And since I've already been an hour, I want to stop here. And I think the next time I thought I was going to get it all done at once, I, I got pretty far, I think. But uh, in this talk, it's like, how to understand your Bible? It's is really the most fascinating biblical history to show you how God works and to show you what he stands for. And if we if we pay attention to it in that vein, we would not let so many people move us away from truth, from what it is that he wants, because he says it over and over and over again, like your commercials, they come over and over and over again till you buy it, like the shows on TV, over and over. It's a syndication, but he gives you different situation, different stances so that you know his judgments, you know his thoughts, and you can know how to live with his culture in the midst of other cultures. I'm going to stop right here, pray, and then open for discussion if there'll be any tonight. Merciful Father, King, eternal, immortal, invisible, that dwells in the light that's unapproachable. I thank you for your blessed word and you teaching us how to think, teaching us how to have your culture and the value of your scriptures and the cohesiveness of it. And Father, I hope that anything that I should have said in this overview that I didn't say, that you will forgive me and let me bring it in the next time if you allow me a next time. But I ask you to let this be a, a catalyst of hope or inspiration for some people that as in the United States, we call the new year, January the 1st. And for our records, that's what we use, that somebody will decide, I'm going to learn my Bible. I'm going to learn it and see what God has said throughout the years and what he's saying to me. Amen. Amen. And even so, amen. I'll now open our class for discussion. If there's any discussion to be had tonight, uh, is there any discussion tonight? Any discussion? Can you hear me? I hear you well. Go ahead, Brother Rich. Tim, I just want to say that that was an excellent message. Thank you, sir. I mean, at all. What now, I want to confess, you know, I started out and I dozed off for a little bit, but then I worked, woke back up and I heard, you know, I heard quite a bit, you know, I mean, man, you were, you were just like cooking with gas <laughs> on the front burn. And it's like, um, to hear you, to hear you do what you did, really, uh, uh, go through, really, today, in the, you know, the Old Testament and the, and the Inner Testament, you know, uh, uh, in an hour or so, that, that's what you say. It, you know, you didn't get through the New Testament. I know you're planning to do that. It was wonderful. Uh, I can't wait. I'm hoping uh, uh, that Ann gets it out there so I can download it pretty quickly. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I, I want to get that and... Uh, and, and uh, 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 you know, listen to that one over and over and over again. I will say that, uh, you know, I, that, that uh, I've been excited in terms of wanting to start new ministry in, uh, in 2019 and everything. And 
I'll you know, tell you about it. I got some ideas. Yes, sir. Uh, this, you know, uh, 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 this really just uh, uh, gave me some excitement. Uh, some excitement. You know, you you show me, and I confess, I don't know the Bible. And you know, and I'm not going to say that I'm going to learn it all in back by 2019, but I'm going to learn a whole lot more of it than I than I do now. And uh, I just want to thank you for everything that you do. I mean, I, I, I really do. Well, I, I, thank, so, I, I thank you for that I, comment. I, and if God's will, if I see that enough people are interested, and maybe even if they're not, I'd like to just kind of do an overview of every book as opposed to just kind of lumping them together. You know, just, just the overview, because let people know what's in here. There's something good in every book, even the book of Obadiah. There's some good stuff in there. Oh, my God, it's good. Because by the time well, you, you know, go ahead. It's, it's, Tim, I, 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 can, I can, you can't see me, but I'm raising my hand right now. And I, say, <laughs> I love to do it. I love to hear you do it. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm raising my hand and saying, uh, yeah, I don't know who it, I don't know if Ann is there or if anybody else is uh, there, but I would love it. I really would. I really would. Well, well thank you for the encouragement. And, you know, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited about being fruitful and just the Lord allowing me to be able to, while I got breath in my body, do something that will bring joy, you know, just bring joy. And just a little bit of why I'm like I am when it comes to the Bible, because I'm sure that people think he's just weird. He's just weird. He comes up with some stuff that other people don't. It's like, but I read it. I'm not just looking at one part. And so by looking at the whole thing, the way that he, you know, he sets it up, it makes a difference in the way that I see things. And I'm just hoping to God that we'll be a benefit to other people at all times in this ministry. Well, see, what you just said, Tim, remind, remind me. And, um, you know, I think you, you know a little bit of the history of my sister and all that's up there someplace in Pennsylvania, wherever she is. Yes, sir. And how, uh, uh, my wife has compared me to her. And, uh, you know, now I can deal with that. But the thing that was interesting now in, in the story that I was telling you, I, I, I asked Kevin, I said, you know, Kevin, Erdine compares me to your Aunt Hannah. Let me, say, well, would you, you, you do know we, I, you do know we live on Facebook, right? Well, it's out there now. Yeah, know, but you now. hadn't told, you hadn't told the whole story yet. Yeah, I'm not going to tell the whole story. Okay. I just want to just tell about what Kevin said. Okay. Okay. Uh, only thing I'm going to say is this. Kevin said, well, you know, you know you're not exactly like I'm Hannah, but you are kind of weird. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, and I said, well, how, you know, he said he can't psychoanalyze me. And see, Tim, you know, I would just say this, with me and this cancer, if it is God's will that I live, I'm going to let him strike a line. You know, all the thing I just really want wanted to, to say to him is I love the Lord. Yes, sir. I love the Lord. And if that seems weird to you, as you to use your term, Tim, these folks out there in Green Bay, in five below weather with no shirts on with big cheese heads on their on their heads, big cheese pieces of cheese on their head. And people don't think that that's strange. I know it. But I do notice I do notice I don't see many of you all black people doing it yet. why you all don't do it? Oh man. <laughs> I could I could <laughs> But see, but see, that's reminding me. I, I don't know if you know you, you, you're in the excitement. I'm just telling you this quick story that I'm gonna that I'm gonna get off. You know, I I I was at the store, and I, you know, Kevin gave me this like it's a it's a it's a hockey jersey. You know, I when I go get my blood checked, 
said I like to wear these jerseys because they're oh, losing it. It's easier for them to get to the get to the arm and get the blood. So I had on this jersey, you know, to me, I, I like it because, of, you know, I like sports shirts because, because of the pretty colors. Right. And hockey, and hockey had no more pretty colors than, uh, than, than, than you know, a lot. So I got this jersey. So I go in the store and the dude is real friendly. And as I walk in, and me and him, I said, all I want to do is get a calendar. So they right up there at the front. And he said, oh, you know, I grab the calendar, go up there, and he's checking me out. And he starts to say to me, he says, you know, my hero is Shaquille O'Neal. <laughs> he, he starts, you know, talking about Shaquille O'Neal. And I said, well, you know, my heroes are Peter Paul and Jay gave me a strange look. He said, the Beatles? <laughs> <laughs> have any comments? Not even one. We don't have any more comments. Are there any on the uh, Facebook line? But since we don't have any comments that I see coming in across the Facebook, then what we'll do is we'll close the discussion for tonight. I think everybody that saw fit to join on this day that people say they say was set apart that's what they say, but that's all I'm gonna say is but. <laughs> thank, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you.